Well, good evening, everyone. Can someone just um, throw in the chat whether or not they can hear me? Perfect. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Uh, I'm glad uh, the IT is working tonight. So welcome along. It, the, um, uh, the webinar's full now, so we may as well uh, make a start. So thank you to everyone uh, that's come along. Obviously, um, uh, for, for financial reasons, we're, we're restricted to 100 uh, people in the uh, in the webinar. Unfortunately, Zoom meetings are just too expensive um, to, uh, to to subscribe to to get more than that. So um, welcome along for the hundreds of you that have made it. So um, for the live webinar, obviously, if, if you know anyone that's trying to get in and can't get in, just let them know this is being recorded, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, within the next day. So, um, so we'll make a start. Perfect. Thank you guys for confirming. So brilliant, welcome along. Um, I can see a lot of faces that we've seen last week and, and uh, in previous series. So welcome back to those of you. Thanks for thanks for popping by and giving up your Monday evening. Those of you who joined us last week know we did um, hypertension, high blood pressure. So we've um, we're kind of following on from that this week by doing heart failure. So um, STC Training Solutions is a pre-hospital care training provider. We we predominantly deal with REC courses and, and annual ILS, BLS updates, et cetera. Um, but we are looking at kind of branching out a bit more into our um, pre-hospital care CPD, um, which kind of spawned on a little bit by lockdown as, as a lot of these things were. Um, so this is one of these uh, offerings that we're doing is this free uh, weekly, although it's, it's looking more likely bi-weekly. So sorry for those of you that were expecting this to be last week. Unfortunately, we were just we were just swamped with work, um, as as is quite often the case at the moment. I think uh, a lot of us can relate to that. So apologies if if we kind of messed you around last week, but here we are. Um, I think probably we're going to go to bi-weekly just because of our workloads at the moment. <clears throat> Both of us working full time in the NHS as well as running the business. So of course it's uh, it's taking uh, a bit of time up. So um, the the purpose of this webinar series, uh, as I explained last week, for those of you that saw that, was that. Um, I, I'm a paramedic uh, by trade. I left the ambulance service um, just over a year ago and moved into primary care. Um, and, and this is a bit of a toolbox for anyone that was wanting to do the same, really. So I've kind of identified some subjects that I felt um, as, as, a, as a standard paramedic on the, you know, ambulance paramedic, you, you don't um, get a huge amount of exposure or training in. Um, and, and these are some of the areas that, that I, I kind of wish I knew I had to read up on before I came into primary care, if that makes sense. So by no means am I an expert, but I'd like to kind of share some of the, uh, the, the experiences and, and, and nice guidelines really just um, to, to kind of talk through um, some of the management of certain conditions. And heart, hypertension last week was a, was a really common one. Uh, heart failure this week is another one that we see loads of. Um, we see exacerbation of heart failure on the road, of course. Um, but understanding kind of primary care management of that is, is slightly different. Now, we'll start with the caveat tonight. We'll be a little bit shorter than last week because actually there's less we do in primary care for heart failure. So tonight is just a bit of an understanding about what heart failure is and, and kind of like the first line treatment. We, we have a pretty low threshold for referring into secondary care, um, which, which is a little bit different from, from hypertension last week. As you see, we kind of go to step four and, and, and rule out red flags before we, before we go into secondary care. It's not so much the case with heart failure. Um, as you'll see, it's, it's a progressive illness and, and actually um, they, these patients do benefit from specialist review. So, um, so here we are. So it is seven o'clock now anyway, so um, we'll, we'll get going. Thank you again uh, for coming along. And um, as, we, as we go through, do let me know if you have any questions. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, so those of you that haven't been along before, we'd like these to be interactive. There is uh, there is a little Mentimeter quiz just at the end um, for, you to, for you to participate in. So if you haven't used that before, just grab your smartphone, use menti.com and, and I'll give you the code when we get to the quiz. You put the code in and it lets you answer and, and, and it comes up on the screen real time, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, you can tweet us, email us or WhatsApp us at any point, even after the webinar's finished. Um, STC admin Charlotte's in there tonight uh, in the chat. So if you have anything um, you want to ask, then then she'll uh, she'll keep an eye out for that. And, and of course, I'll keep an eye on the chat. So if any questions come up, I'll do my best to answer them all um, as we go through. So... Um, here we are then. So what are we going to talk to you about tonight? So the pathophysiology of heart failure, what is it basically? The diagnosis, uh, the nice guidelines for the initial management, some pharmacodynamics again of, of the common medications. Some of them are, are, are similar to, to last week's um, antihypertensives. Um, and then we are going to talk about referral into secondary care. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of if, if in doubt, speaks for specialists tonight. 
So um, this is one of the if, if you want to if you want to think of it in in being an easier condition to manage in primary care because we don't do that much. We 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 ultimately we recognise it. We start the initial treatments and send them into secondary care, and then we we work in in partnership with the heart failure teams and the multidisciplinary teams. Um, once they've been to the specialist, been diagnosed, and been medicated, we kind of keep an eye on them, if you like. So actually, um, less for us to do certainly in the initial stages, but still a very complex illness, and uh, these patients have often quite poor qualities of life so um, I'm sure there will be lots of research going on in the background into how we can improve what we're doing at the moment so uh, an interesting area certainly um, and obviously very linked to hypertension last week which is why I did the two so close together um, that uh, episodes on YouTube of those of you uh, that, that didn't get to see that so um, just a quick refresh then um, of, of what the heart's main function is heart failure obviously is, is, is a very simple definition of, of the, the heart not being able to supply um, enough blood um, for, for the demands of the body in effect and, and there's two main types that we're going to we're going to kind of talk about so, um, so normal function of the heart, obviously the, the right side of the heart there, uh, predominantly in blue, in blue with the oxygenated blood, um, is dealing with the, um, the, the circulation to the, uh, the, the lungs, so the pulmonary circulation. The blood arrives in the uh, right atrium from the venous return um, through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle where it's pumped to the lungs. Uh, it's oxygenated, obviously comes back through the pulmonary uh, veins back into the left atrium through the uh, mitral valve into the left ventricle and, and out into the aorta and obviously systemic circulation, we, which it should all be fairly comfortable with that. And, and heart failure, we've said, is, is a failure of the, of, the, of the heart to be able to pump enough blood um, around the body. So I said there are two main types. Okay, so hopefully a bit of a recap um, for anyone that has run into this before. So, so we, have, we have the normal heart in the middle there, and then we have cyst, something called systolic dysfunction. Um, which is the inability of the of the heart to contract with enough force um, to to supply blood to the rest of the body. So so it's a, a function of the of systole, systole being when the ventricles are contracted and the highest possible blood pressure uh, within the main arteries. So when when we have the inability of the heart to to squeeze with enough force, we we say we have systolic dysfunction. Um, and then conversely, we also have diastolic dysfunction. Diastolic dysfunction is is the inability of the heart to fill completely at end, at end diastole. So, um, and, and we notice that the, the heart muscle is much thicker in that case. So actually the ventricular volume is, is reduced um, and, that is, and that is diastolic dysfunction. So they are the main types, the main two types and the differences between the two. You notice with systolic dysfunction, um, you have dilation of the ventricles and you have a relative thinning of the of the, the, the left ventricle myocardium in particular, but, but to a certain extent on both sides, um, as opposed to normal and certainly when you look then across to the diastolic with the, with the um, left ventricular hypertrophy going on there. Now, of course, um, heart failure is, is more than just, um, just uh, systolic and diastolic dysfunction or, and affecting both sides of the heart at the same time. We, we, we should all know that um, you, you can have left ventricular failure or left-sided heart failure in isolation, as you can also have right-sided heart failure in isolation. Now, um, most commonly, as we'll see in, in the processes that lead up to it, that the left ventricular um, uh, failure tends to occur first, um, and then right ventricular failure occurs secondary, so then you get um, complete heart failure. So um, we're, we're going to look at um, ways ways that we tell the difference. So, so ejection fraction is one of those, and an ejection fraction is is calculated um, under transthoracic um, echocardiogram. So it's not something we do in primary care, but it's worth knowing about. So a normal ejection fraction um, being at more than forty percent or, or 0.4. Um, we calculate it through stroke volume. So the 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 quantity of blood being ejected through the uh, through the aorta. Uh, or in, in, and actually we measure both sides, say through the pulmonary arteries also. Um, and we divide that by end diastolic volume. So that is the, the, the volume within the ventricles um, at the end of diastole when, when, they, are, when they should be completely filled. Okay, um, it's expressed as a percentage or, or, as a, or as a fraction, less than 40% is, is abnormal. And, and there's, the, there's the thing just to remember there. So stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume, as I say, not something we do in primary care, but it's interesting to know. 
um, that that actually these um, these these figures are being calculated by by cardiology when we refer them into secondary care for the full diagnosis of of uh, heart failure. We are we are actually looking at um, uh, getting a, a figure of this. I'm just going to flip back to this slide. So just to, just to show you how we then start to appreciate that that these can be the the um, ejection fraction can be different in the two types of heart failure. So if you look on the left with systolic dysfunction. You can see that, relatively speaking, certainly in comparison to the diastolic dysfunction diagram, you can see that we'll, we'll take the left ventricle in isolation here, but it has a much greater volume, doesn't it? So you would expect end diastolic volume to be uh, to be much greater um, in in the systolic dysfunction, as opposed to the end diastolic volume being much less in in diastolic dysfunction. Now we've said that in in systolic dysfunction we have a, a reduction in the ability of the cardiac myocytes to contract with with great force, um, and therefore we lose we we lose an element of stroke volume, don't we? So whilst the whilst the um, end diastolic volume is large, the the capacity of the of the left ventricle here is large in comparison. The the actual ejected blood through the aorta is relatively small. Okay, so we notice then that we see a reduction in, in um, ejection fraction with systolic dysfunction. Now with diastolic uh, dysfunction, we, we notice that actually whilst the, the ejection, uh, whilst the, the, the quantity of blood, the stroke volume uh, ejected through the aorta is, is going to be reduced, it's going to be reduced by definition in heart failure. The end diastolic volume is also is also decreased. So actually, in in diastolic dysfunction, sorry, in diastolic dysfunction, you see pre what we call preserved ejection fraction. Because actually, if you if we go to the next page, if your if your stroke volume is reduced in both of them, if the end diastolic volume is high in systolic dysfunction, then we're going to see um, a a low fraction. And and actually, if 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 both of these are low, then we are going to see a preserved fraction. Just by um, just by looking at that mathematically, so so this is how we can start to tell the difference. Um, the other obviously imaging is is also going to tell us. So there's quite a quite a notable difference on on chest X-ray and and um, and under ultrasound of a of a dilate, dilated left ventricle through um, heart failure versus a uh, a very kind of muscular and and um, fibrous left ventricle through um, dystolic dysfunction. Diastolic dysfunction. Sorry. So, um, talking about so, so dilation of the ventricles, weakening the heart muscle. This is this is what sets systolic dysfunction apart, and and we know that we have a poor ejection fraction. It's often referred to as HFREF, so heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Okay. Um, so you may see that term um, come up and down. I see nice don't refer to it too much, but in quite a lot of the literature around heart failure, you'll see HFREF. Um, and HF NEF as, as heart failure with normal ejection fraction, which we'll talk about in just a second. So, so common causes of this, um, we're going to be looking for um, it's it's death of death of heart muscle effectively from from another cause. So we're looking at coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease, and MI, that kind of group of um, cardiovascular disease um, that's going to lead to cell death. As as cells die, they tend to stretch out. They 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 lose the ability. Obviously, the the remaining cells that are alive. Um, you know, can't can't ultimately um, contract with enough force as, as as they would have done if all their comrades had been there. Ultimately, that that increases myocardial oxygen demands. The whole point with heart, with heart failure is that that it's not the, losing the ability to supply enough oxygen, uh, not just to the rest of the body but to itself. So you can see that heart failure, certainly in systolic dysfunction, as you'll see, the same in, in diastolic dysfunction is actually um, a bit of a, a vicious spiral. It's a bit of a a, um, a, a cycling. Of, of continually getting worse and and you'll see in diastolic dysfunction very much the same with heart failure being the overarching diagnosis of not being able to supply enough blood to to the body and and of course to itself so um we also we're also interested in in valve disease with heart failure so we can have now now these are these are notoriously difficult to manage these patients and and often end up with valve replacements but certainly specialist cardiac input this isn't something we would consider managing in, in primary care for very long. This is, um, so valve disease, we're, we're particularly interested, whilst any valve can cause um, an element of, of heart failure, uh, mitral regurgitation and, and H, uh, aortic stenosis are, are particularly 
um, associated with um, systolic dysfunction. Now you'll see on the next slide, unfortunately aortic stenosis is also associated with diastolic dysfunction. So there's, there's an element of overlap between the valve diseases um, in, in which type of dysfunction they're going to cause. And, and certainly from, from the, the literature I've been reading in, in preparation for tonight, there doesn't seem to be uh, a consensus on, on why or how, should I say. We, we understand why valve defects cause heart failure. But, but there isn't there isn't so much of a consensus on why sometimes uh, aortic stenosis will cause systolic dysfunction and other times it causes diastolic dysfunction. But um, you can imagine, say with with mitral um, regurgitation, effectively, um, what's happening is the blood is being squeezed, you know, both both through the pulmonary valve, um, but uh, but it's also sorry, through the uh, it's, it's being squeezed out through the aorta, but also some of it is is leaking back through the the mitral valve um, back into the the pulmonary circuit. If that makes sense. Um, so so for the for the heart to pump effectively, it's going to have to pump a, a lot harder. Uh, and that is where the, the, the cycle starts ultimately. With aortic stenosis, the, 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 the pathology behind that is with stenosis, the valve isn't opening all the time. It's not, it's not opening um, fully. Um, and of course, ejecting blood through a narrow orifice is, is, going to, is going to cause higher pressures within the ventricle. If the higher pressures continue, then we start to see uh, dynamic change within the within the myocytes they start to beef themselves up don't they get stronger and, and as and as the disease progresses the ability for the heart to supply itself with enough oxygen degrades uh, and that's when you start to see the cell death now that's when you you may initially start with diastolic dysfunction with the with the, the bulking up of the left ventricular myocytes um, and then ending with 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 systolic dysfunction. Who knows that that there, there does seem to be a bit of a an overlap um, with with aortic stenosis. Um, so cardiomyopathies. We, we've we've done a we've done a lecture on cardiomyopathies as part of the ECG series. So I won't go into any details of those tonight. But cardiomyopathies can can obviously lead to systolic dysfunction, where the where the myocytes are specifically um, targeted or, or specifically um, abnormal. And arrhythmia is certainly a cause of acute heart failure, can't they? You know, new AF and and uh, new ventricular arrhythmias um, can certainly cause um, can certainly cause acute heart failure. Prolonged, if they're undiagnosed, can certainly lead to systolic dysfunction and, and, and chronic heart failure. So diastolic dysfunction, we've said, is myocardial hypertrophy with with reduced ventricular compliance, obviously stiffening where 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 myocytes die, they become fibrous, and 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 obviously fibrous um, dead cells don't um, don't have compliance, don't have elasticity. So um, we we preserve our ejection fraction, as I've said, because both systolic, um, uh, sorry, um, both the 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 volume ejected volume and the um, end diastolic volume are both reduced. So stroke volume, sorry, was the word I'm looking for. Stroke volume and end diastolic volume are both reduced, so the fraction is preserved. Okay. Um, again, causes so the most common cause by far is chronic hypertension, undiagnosed hypertension, that left ventricle fighting against systemic um, vascular resistance. Um, it's going to cause um, uh, a beefing up of the, the muscle, isn't it? So again, this valve disease, aortic stenosis in particular, is also associated with diastolic dysfunction for the reasons uh, I mentioned before of, of, of pushing through a narrow orifice with the, with the aortic valve not opening properly. So, um, and then hypertrophic and restrictive cardiomyopathy specifically um, can cause diastolic um, dysfunction again. Uh, but again, we've, we've talked about cardiomyopathies on, on another lecture, so feel free to have a look back on YouTube if, if that's something you've, um, you've forgotten about. So, so they're, they're, the two, they're the two main types. We have a classification system you might come across, certainly when you read the NICE guidance, it's the New York Heart Association um, Heart Failure Classification, so class one to four. Class one being normal, class four being um, horrific symptoms, um, and the idea is obviously we try we try and keep our patients from getting to this point. We try and identify the heart failure at the stage where they're at risk, where they're still class one, where they don't get symptoms, um, and uh, and then uh, obviously inevitably it, it is a progressive disease. We we can't at the moment cure it. Um, heart transplant is is ultimately the gold standard treatment, and 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 any of you that that work in primary care already will will know how rare that is. Um, or heaven forbid, have had anyone in the family that's that's um, that's been on a heart transplant list. It's it's not a lot. It's uh, not a short wait, is it? So, so class two being slight limitation of physical activity, but comfortable at rest. Class three being marked limitation of, of physical activity, but possibly still comfortable at rest, i.e., or, or starting to creep up the the um, the MRC breathlessness scale. 
um, uh, with with kind of having to slow a bit when when walking with peers, etc. And then class four is is pretty much you know always symptomatic. Um, and we we definitely don't want these patients. Um, we don't want our patients getting to this stage if we can help it. But unfortunately, you know, being a progressive disease, a lot will. Um, and and ultimately, then we're we're you know, they they are they are difficult patients to manage in in palliative care as well, aren't they? You know, breathlessness symptom control is 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 notoriously difficult in in end of life care. Um, can be very very distressing for the patient which is obviously not not what we want at all so um so we we've kind of gone through to so the two main the two main forms of heart failure um diagnosis i think is largely and, and certainly um refers back to it in nice it's, it's largely based on your history actually a history suggestive of heart failure so we can work backwards can't we we know that um in both types of heart failure you're you're having poor ejection of blood um, so we we know that or, or reduced reduced stroke volume in 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 both cases. So we um, we know that if we're if we're ejecting less blood, then less blood must be coming in. But actually, if we're if we we, we then tend to think of like I saw one one lecture which which uh, talked about imagine a, a car crash on the motorway and and actually you've got very little traffic um, uh, you know being ejected from the heart. The car crash has happened in the heart. Uh, and you've got the kind of tailbacks leading up to it. I always think that's that's quite a nice analogy. Um, so you do get some backing up of blood, don't you? And we know that if if blood um, is is allowed to kind of back up under any significant pressure in places where it wouldn't normally be, um, we we get um, we get edema buildup. We get congestion congestion ultimately, which is um, congestive heart failure. That's where that comes from. Um, and and the the the, the, the easy to spots signs of that aren't they are, are the edema so we know that if, if we get back up in the uh, from the left ventricle we're going to see that edema predominantly within the um the pulmonary um uh, system aren't we so we're going to get pulmonary edema and, and possibly some some liver backup and, and abnormal liver function tests and and, and uh, ascites etc um and and from the right ventricle we're going to see more systemic um pulmonary edema so it, the peripheral edema sorry so we're going to see ankle swelling possibly sacral swelling in the in the more uh, bed bound patients so so we're looking for um that kind of fluid build up now with that fluid build up you can kind of guess the the signs and symptoms we're going to start to see obviously breathlessness being one of them one of the main the main side effects that that uh, annoying kind of watery cough um, the the edema, the edema of his legs that become so heavy that you 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 waste so much energy trying to walk, and and that puts you off exercising and all this type of stuff. Um, and then of course, don't forget, there's all the there's all the, all the queer morbidities that go with heart failure. Generally, these patients aren't aren't healthy. Generally speaking, you know, we can get heart failure in, in healthy adults for for other reasons. But when we're talking about um, heart failure because of uh, ischemic heart disease or hypertension, which is the, the most common causes. We're going to have other dysfunction in the body. It's, it's to be expected. We're going to have renal failure. We're going to have um, diabetes. We're going to have hyper hyperlipidemia. We're going to have you know high high stroke and, and Q risks. So, um, so we do need to take into account everything about the patient. And and a lot of what we do next is 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 dependent on on what other comorbidities we think are there lying undiagnosed or, or have already been diagnosed so but predominantly to diagnose um to diagnose uh, heart failure is relatively simple it's a history suggestive of heart failure and, and certainly clinical findings that, that that point in that direction and and it's quite simply a blood test it's the it's bnp for sure but the uh, n terminal pro B type natriuretic peptide, the word I really struggle to say. <laughs> natriuretic uh, peptide. NT -pro, pro BNP is the one that we use locally. It's one recommended by NICE. Um, it, in, on your on your ice systems or, or blood request systems, it might it might just be down as BNP. Um, but that is that is what NICE uh, recommend that we test the NT pro BNP. It's released um, in in response to um stretch receptors within the myocytes within the cardiac myocytes so when they're stretched um and stretched as in kind of other cells dying and, and having to work extra hard and things like that they release um nt pro bmp um which is measurable in blood in in minute minute levels um just keeping an eye on the chat um for, so uh, sorry, missed a question there from from Richard. Um, so, uh, experience of uh, secondary accepting referrals often find it's quite difficult as the patients are either too well or disease progression is so late they often reject. 
Um, so with, it's very clear actually, Richard, on, on, on heart failure terms, um, the NICE guidance is very clear. And we, we are just about to, to come on to that funnily enough. So good question. So um, now the referral criteria for, for secondary care for cardiology is um, that we have to have a history suggestive of heart failure and we have to have a raised BNP. Now raised is anything over 400 uh, nanograms per litre which is a tiny, tiny amount. Um, so between 400 and 2000, the, the guidance says that that, suggests, uh, that supports your diagnosis of heart failure. If you have a history suggestive of heart failure in a BMP over 400 in a patient that's not being treated for heart failure already, obviously, or, or I'll show you some, some other um, medications and things that can uh, artificially lower your, your BMP. But provided we've got a patient that's not on those, you know, a, a level of 400 to 2,000 would um, would definitely support your diagnosis. Now, I've never had um, a heart failure referral rejected, um, Richard, if if that answers your question. So, and and we certainly do see our fair share at our surgery of of um, uh, lads and ladies that come in with with breathlessness and you know a bit of a weight and some other comorbidities going on breathless on exertion when we've got a few things that we're thinking it could or couldn't be do their BMP and it's up through the roof I mean we we that's that's I've, I've never I've never had a referral rejected um but the guidance around heart failure is, is very very clear what we can and can't do in in, in primary care and actually in initial stages we can't do a huge amount so it, it, everything everything depends on the transthoracic echocardiogram so um getting the patient that as soon as possible is is the uh is, is the goal here. Now, um, I've put in over 2000 because the guidance does does state that we, we work a little bit faster, like like anything, there's always that kind of, this is the point in which you refer, and then this is the point in which we kind of all go hands on deck. So um, a patient presenting initially with a, with a BMP of higher than 2000, um, it's definitely associated um, with, with much poorer outcomes. Um, so so it's, it's no surprise that that becomes an urgent referral, it becomes a two-week um, referral, but not two-week rule in, in the such that we think of, of uh, cancer referrals. Um, but uh, in, yeah, ultimately, it's the same type of thing. It's often referred to as a two-week rule, two -week rule uh, for cardiology, um, but it's not two-week um, uh, cancer, clearly. So uh, let me just bring that one back. So uh, there we go. So um, other, so I put in here. I've just grayed them out because they're not our priority realistically. But I, although I'd say you know almost always we get a chest X-ray unless they've had one recently. But so um, so you 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 want your history suggestive of heart failure and you want your raised BNP uh, over four hundred. Um, we will talk about what if you think it's it's heart failure and their BNP is not high because there are a few reasons why their BNP may be artificially low. In which case you can still refer. Um, so, um, and, and maybe Richard, maybe they're the ones you're thinking of that, that might be a little bit more difficult, but as long as you make a case, I've never, I've never known secondary care be too difficult, but maybe we're just lucky in our area. But um, certainly be, going to be requesting a chest x-ray um, and, and an ECG. With chest x-ray, we're looking for um, differentials, don't forget, but we're also looking for pulmonary edema um, and, um, and, and the shape of the heart, because that's going to help us decide whether it's systolic or diastolic, isn't it? So. Um, uh, Alexa just announcing someone's at the door there, that's really good. And um, so then we have your um, ECG, we're looking for um, left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, we're looking for cardiac arrhythmias, um, we're looking for anything else really that could that could be pointing to what's going on. You'll see from the list that actually PE is one of the one of the causes of, of raised BNP as well. So that's certainly not one you want to get wrong, is it? So uh, symptoms of heart failure and, and, and actually they've, they've got right ventricular strain, a, a big old PE. Um, yeah, absolutely, uh, and it's a good question. So, so uh, in terms of acute heart failure, absolutely. If if you remove the if you remove the trigger quick enough and, and no structural changes have occurred, then then absolutely, um, it, it can be it can be reversible. So, um, heart failure is a result of a ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, you know, cardiovert the, um, the 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 VT or whatever it is that they're in, and and absolutely. Um, there, there should be there should be no reason why they wouldn't regain normal cardiac output. Um, what when it's not reversible is is unfortunately when you get to the point where the structural changes within the heart, so i i.e. The, the the ventricles are dilating, or or they're becoming more fibrous and and uh, hypertrophy, if that makes sense, or hypertrophic. Um, so the ECG is useful. The ECG, um, I think, I think we always do anyway with with anyone presenting with presenting with with kind of breathlessness, just to make sure we're not dealing with an AF or or, or some some other issue going on. 
full thickness infarct that we've missed and that type of stuff, you know, what patients missed. Um, so, so again, looking at differentials, peak flow with or without spirometry, if you're thinking that actually this breathlessness could be a, a, a pulmonary cause, also you'll see from the next slide, if, you, if your BNP is within that 400 to 2000, you're referred for, for cardiology and ideally should be seen within six weeks. So during the six weeks, why don't we get all of this stuff done? Because it's going to help prevent, uh, you know, pre uh, paint a, a much clearer picture, isn't it, at the end diagnosis? Because what if cardiology send them back saying, no, that their, their um, ejection fraction is fine, they've got no valvular defects, you know, back to you, primary care, sort them out. So by that point, we, we'd like to know whether we've missed any other differentials, wouldn't we? So chest x-ray is going to be useful for, for things like COPD and, 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 and proving the heart failure too, and, and maybe differentiating between the two types. ECG is going to be useful to look for uh, arrhythmias or, or, or other cardiac causes. Peak flow and spirometry, again, you might be able to get in a diagnosis of COPD. And if somebody will have heart failure around COPD, that's that's a relatively common comorbidity, isn't it? Um, additional blood tests, because in fact, as I said to you, these patients aren't going to be necessarily well, particularly if they've, they've developed this heart failure from, from ongoing heart problems and hypertension, etc. If they have cardiovascular disease, they're likely to have disease elsewhere. They're likely to have deranged uh, renal liver functions, thyroid functions, hyperlipidemia if they're not on statins already, if they're, you know, it might be undiagnosed diabetic. So we, we don't just treat what they come in for, do we? Um, and this is, the, this is, I think, the big difference between the ambulance world and, and primary care is they may, they may only come in for, you know, they're a bit breathless from time to time. But actually, we haven't seen them in seven, eight years. That's, that's really not that uncommon, <laughs> if not more. Um, so uh, absolutely, a lot, a lot can go on. And urine ACR, again, we're looking at renal function, we're looking at kidney disease there, aren't we? If we're seeing high levels of, of albumin in the urine, albumin to creatinine ratio, if that's raised. Um, but again, so I've put those in grey because you wouldn't necessarily do those for every patient and they're not necessarily going to help you with the diagnosis. But then again, the, you know, like anything, the more information, the better. And, and, and you don't want the patient to come back to you in six weeks after having their routine cardiology and, and, and cardiology write to you and say it's not heart failure. Think of something else. At least if we've done all this, we, we've got a better understanding of what, what it could be. Um, so the referral guidelines, so to, to answer a couple of questions that are coming up there. So um, between 400 to 2,000, as I said, refer to cardiology for assessment and transthoracic echocardiogram within six weeks. That's what nice to say. I know the wait time um, has crept, crept up a little bit recently, as, as, as is to be expected. Um, if their PNP is over 2,000, though, we should be referring it urgently and they should be getting seen within two weeks. Um, and obviously we would we would wrap up all the other all the other tests that we want to order as quickly as possible as well if if not same day we can we can normally get bloods and ecg done same day unless they walk in at half past four on a friday afternoon but um and chest x-ray again depending on how how well you get on with your local radiography radiology department you, you can normally get them seen same day um troponin you can you can order troponin in primary care um, uh, we, we don't routinely because often, so we get two blood collections a day at our surgery. So if you know if you take your bloods first thing in the morning, you'll have the um, the high sensitivity trot back by the afternoon. But um, certainly, if you if you take one in the afternoon, you're not going to get the results for the next day. I, I do always say if you if you're thinking it's another D dimer is the other one, D dimer and high sensitivity trots. If you're taking those in primary care, you've got to ask whether really you should be sending your patient into hospital. Um, I think their their results that you, if if they come back abnormal, you've you've lost too much time, haven't you? Your patient's gone home, and I either having a you know a DVT or 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 a, an M STEMI, then um, not not really. So um, yeah, absolutely. If you if you think if you're thinking the patient has a need for those things, then then ideally they should be in hospital really, or, or go to the ambulatory care unit to have them done. So at least they can be admitted if if they if they are abnormal. Um, so there we go. Um, so I've, I've mentioned a couple of times there are some there are some uh, factors out there that lower your BNP uh, artificially. So now bizarrely obesity, um, being of African or Afro Caribbean origin, um, these two things can can lower the, these these groups of patients have lower BNPs. So you know uh, even even in illness. Um, again, I couldn't find a definitive reason as to why, but it seems to be linked to. Um, how they respond to things like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. There just seems to be some 
um, inherent difference in the genetics um, that that affect things like this. So, and as you'll see, um, being on ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers uh, and also beta blockers can lower your your BMP. So, don't forget if you've got a patient presenting um, now. That, now this is I'll, I'll pop the other the other ones up there, but um, obviously this is not an uncommon picture. I think um, any of you that are doing primary care already for for um, somebody who is obese and already on an ACE inhibitor or something for their for their blood pressure, um, especially if they're diabetic already and they'll be they'll be on an ACE inhibitor. Um, and actually, then if they're if they're obese and on an ACE inhibitor, um, and they're now presenting with signs and symptoms of heart failure actually their, their BMP could be artificially drugged below 400, couldn't it? So this is this grey area now where actually you would still speak to your cardiology department. We have something called advice and guidance. I think that's a national thing. Um, so we can write to our local um, cardiologists and, and get some advice and guidance from them. Um, and, and sometimes that can be same day. They are they are pretty on the ball, I've got to say, our local departments. So um, I think they'd much rather just give you the right advice there and then than, than have the patient referred through the system and, and we get it wrong. So um, which which makes sense. So the, these are those types of patients you're going to you're going to chat to cardiology maybe rather than refer straight away. But if you've got somebody overweight on an ACE inhibitor for hypertension and, and possibly type two diabetic on uh, you know on the back of that. Um, and, and they're presenting with heart failure symptoms, by all means, have that chat, even if their BMP is not normal, uh, sorry, is normal, sorry. And then diuretics as well. So if, it, it, typically, we're, we, you know, it, it, for, for people to be on diuretics, we're, we're probably assuming there's an element of heart failure going on anyway, but, but not always. Um, so particularly the potassium sparing, so, or the um, uh, MRAs, so the angiotensin um, receptor blockers. So, uh, no, sorry, not those, the, the uh, um, cause get steroid ones. So, um, so that's his spironolactone. So the potassium sparing MRAs are it, the spironolactone is the only one of those that we uh, we currently use in the UK. So, so those four factors can lower. There are there are many more that can raise it though. So this is why I think we keep in mind differentials when we're talking about BNP because it's not uncommon. You think this is bond or being this is bond or heart failure. Um, you get, we send them off to we send you know you get a, a raised. BNP, send them off to cardiology and, and they come back and say, no, it's not it's fine. They've got a good ejection fraction, their, their heart's normal, their valves are okay. Think again. So these are the types of things you can think of. So it can be raised in, in the over 70s. Um, that being said, wouldn't be massively raised. So it's obviously a BNP of, of you know, a thousand plus in an over 70 year old is still abnormal, but certainly the higher hundreds you, you might say is, is a function of age. So I've, I've put in left ventricular hypertrophy because of another cause, um, and um, LVA, sorry, and uh, right ventricular strain. Um, it, PE is one of the one of the causes of, of raised BMP. Um, so ischemia in general. So again, we we are we are potentially at the, at the end of the day if you've got acute ischemia going on, if you don't treat that, it's going to lead to heart failure, isn't it? So, um, and tachycardia in itself, so just the, just the patient presenting with a high heart rate, so potentially through fever or stress, et cetera, could be um, causing uh, a slight raise in BMP. But again, you've got to take this into, you know, like, like anything, it's, it's the clinical picture, isn't it? That actually you, um, uh, if, if you've got somebody sitting with a, a slightly raised BMP and they've got one of these things on the screen going on, then, then perhaps we can say it's not heart failure. Um, but actually, if we're if we're getting up over a thousand, we we can say, do you know, what we need to we need to definitively rule out heart failure. So um, hypoxemia, CKD, so chronic kidney disease, sepsis, COPD, diabetes, liver cirrhosis. So really, quite a few differentials in there that that are going to present fairly similarly. Certainly, the you know exacerbation of COPD slash heart failure can be quite a hard differentiation, can't it? Um, and, and I know that's troubled us on the road with do we don't we give furosemide etc. So what's the sensitivity and specificity for, for BMP? So um, good question. So BMP is a very good uh, negative uh, predictor. So um, we if, if, if the BMP is normal you can comfortably say it's not heart failure um, but it's, it's not as good a um, positive predictor and that is because of this long list of factors that can raise the BMP other than just myocardial stretching in, in heart failure, does that make sense? So, so it, it is it's it is good, good negative predictor, but not so much a, a positive predictor. But then again, you know, as you say, it's, it's one of, if, if you've got somebody with heart failure symptoms and a raised BMP, it's it's heart failure until proven otherwise. But once they do prove it's otherwise, then, then you've got this list of things, and hence why we order those other tests. 
during that period of, of waiting. So, um, as with anything, there's lifestyle advice, isn't there? So uh, avoiding smoking and alcohol, weight loss and dietary changes. There's a section in nice guidance about salt and fluid restrictions. Um, so we should we should only really be restricting fluids if, if they have dilutional uh, hyponatremia. So with all of these patients, um, it, as you'll see when we get on to medicating them, a close eye on their renal function and using these is, is um, called for. So if we're seeing dilutional hyponatremia, then, then absolutely do a, do a restricted fluid. Um, or fluid uh, balance chart. Um, if, if we, we would only restrict salt if they were hyponatremic, generally speaking, and, and if we are doing that, we, we don't want to um, push the patients towards potassium-based salt alternatives. As you'll see, all of the medications um, and the worsening heart failure itself will put the patient at risk of hyperkalemia in any case. Um, when you see when we when we're treating um, you know uh, reduced ejection fractions in patients with chronic CKD. Uh, or sorry, high levels of CKD. We're we're um, we're particularly worried about their potassium levels. So, so um, so with reduced ejection fraction. So there's two there's two kind of treatment goals. But so so predominantly speaking, those with with preserved ejection fraction tend to be less symptomatic. Um, but that's not that's not everyone. Okay. So so the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, they have a fairly kind of simple initial starting process going on obviously we're, we're making the diagnosis based on on history and an increased bmp um and and at that point we would refer off to cardiology but in the meantime there's nothing start, stopping us from starting the first line treatments which are an ace inhibitor um and, and a beta blocker so it's an ace inhibitor and a beta blocker as standard okay and for both it's the maximum tolerated dose for that patient all right now this is this is in a patient so first of all we'll talk about patients where their renal function is okay um the the only caveat with the ace inhibitor is there is valve disease present or if you suspect valvular disease i.e the heart sounds are abnormal um then we seek special advice before starting any treatment but but if you're happy that there's no valve disease at, at play um, then, then we titrate up to the maximum tolerated dose of an ACE inhibitor. So, um, uh, typically speaking, perindipril um, is, is what we use locally. So, start at a low dose up every two weeks and, and checking um, blood pressure and, and renal function, um, certainly during that process, particularly paying attention to sodium potassium. Um, as we as we up the dose, um, obviously ACE inhibitor is going to have hypotensive side effects. So um, when when we mean maximum tolerated dose, we mean to the point where the patient's not getting postural hypotension. Um, we we monitor monthly for three months, and then every uh, every six months once they're established on that treatment. But don't forget they're going to be under cardiology. We we we're, we're not going to be the the C treating discharge in this case. Not like with with hypertension quite often we we are the only ones managing the cardiology are going to be having input on this and, and may well change our plans and frequently do so um as as with hypertension although we want to we want to kind of make this a last resort really because arbs aren't as effective but if an ace inhibitor is not tolerated then we go for an, an angiotensin receptor blocker that is licensed for heart failure and lasartan and candesartan are the two um, that seems to do favourably. Again, candesartan is our favoured one locally, but um, they're, they're every every CCG or primary care network has their own um, has their own preference. Um, and and if neither the ACE inhibitor or the ALB is tolerated, then again we go back to specialist care. So we go to specialist care um, if if we think the valves might be the reason for the for the heart failure, and we go to specialist care if the first line treatments don't work. Okay. So, so the, the other first line treatment, and this isn't this is ACE inhibitor and beta blocker. We want to try and get these patients both but onto both of these, and as early as possible, because this this prevent this prevents the structural changes within the heart as, as much as we can. So, um, so it does say in there. So quite often we don't give beta blockers with peripheral vascular disease, with erectile dysfunction, diabetes, um, interstitial lung disease, or, or COPD. We quite often don't use beta blockers because it can make those situations worse. But they do say in, if heart failure is diagnosed. Then, then we we go ahead and give uh, give the maximum tolerated dose of beta blocker. Obviously, beta blockers will reduce blood pressure, but they also reduce heart rate. We don't want to make the the, the patient hemodynamically unstable. We certainly don't want postural hypotension. The two of these drugs together, as you as you can work out in your head, are, are going to both have very similar effects on their hemodynamic stability. So um, uh, every patient's going to react differently to these. Start low, go slow. That's the the, the nice uh, guidance I've certainly heard uh, our doctors talking about that. 
um, and then um, titrated with the maximum dose, keeping a, a very close eye on, on your patient's um, general presentation as you do it. The, the kind of second line, so once that's stopped work or if, if they don't work, you get to the maximum permitted doses of basically your chosen ACE inhibitor and beta blocker. Um, and you want to go for something more, then we, we talk about the uh, potassium sparing um, diuretics, so uh, spironolactone. Okay, um, that would be in addition to the ACE inhibitors uh, or ARBs if they're on them. Um, and again, we've we've got to monitor those blood pressures and using these before and after prescribing. We, we're putting these patients at uh, risk of renal failure and and um, hyper uh, hyperkalemia most definitely um, with all of these medications. So um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and chronic kidney disease, I think gets about, you know, the, the, I, I, often, I often get asked what are the most difficult patients um, that you, you find to manage. And, and of course, um, it's, it's not just me managing them, it's the GPs, thankfully. But these, the, I think if you ask any of the GPs, they, they tend to say the same answer. It's, it's these patients where you're, you're constantly doing the, the yo-yo seesaw of, of managing their heart failure symptoms but then putting them into, into renal failure um, and, and then letting the kidneys recover but in the meantime they develop all their heart failure symptoms again. These patients are, are you know, I mean we, we say it's, it's rubbish for us but my god just think about the quality of life. They're, they're constantly constantly seesawing between full of fluid and, and renal failure. It can't be, it can't be pleasant. So these, these are difficult patients but thankfully we are we are um, very quick to seek specialist advice uh, in these groups and and those that are, are are really good with the with all the medications and things like in cardiology they they can they can normally come up with a concoction that works for a little while so if basically if their if their um, glomerular filtration rate is over thirty um, then we can use the same treatment but we just we're just mindful of using lower doses and slower titration and and more careful monitoring of their renal function. Um, loop diuretics, as we'll say, and, and potassium sparing diuretics have the potential to, um, to, to to throw people down the CKD route a little bit. So we've, we've got to be careful with kidney function. Um, and then uh, renal function less than less than thirty of the EGFR, then then we are definitely just going to go to specialist advice because these patients are really high risk of hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia comes with it, um, ventricular arrhythmias and 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 death. Realistically, a ventricular arrhythmia or an established heart failure patient with CKD is not going to survive, are they? So, good. So, um, so we, we talk about, so now basically the, the, the treatment for normal ejection fraction and, and symptomatic uh, reduced ejection fraction. So what I mean by that is symptomatic reduced ejection fraction heart failure patients are, are going to be those that are on their ACE inhibitor and, and, and uh, beta blocker and they're doing quite well, but they then start to get some pulmonary or peripheral edema. What do we do? It's nice and simple. It's loop diuretics first line. If the symptoms don't respond to your first line loop diuretics, then we do seek specialist advice. I put in grey thiazides and thiazide like diuretics and potassium sparings again. Um, just because they are um, they are often used kind of second line whilst we're waiting for cardiology to come back to us, but but it does it does say a nice guidance if the loop diuretics don't work, seek specialist seek specialist advice um, uh, about where you go next. But you you, you will in, undoubtedly see um, uh, indapamide and and uh, spironolactone being being prescribed in addition to the, the loop diuretics um, in these in these symptomatic patients. Um, there is just a note though with um, with the calcium channel blockers. So um, so avoiding the non dihydropyridine um, calcium channel blockers such as diltiazem and and verapamil, because uh, if you if you looked at last week's hypertension um, video, um, you'll remember that they they do target the calcium channel blockers on the in the myocardium a little bit more and can reduce contractility. The the whole problem with heart failure is contractility in a lot of cases. Let's not knock that off. So diltiazem and verapamil, and plus they reduce heart rate. So you're just going to compound the heart failure symptoms. Um, so, so we do avoid these. Again, calcium channel blockers in any form we, we use with caution in heart failure, but certainly not these two. If we can help it. Um, we'll talk about the drugs. Uh, those of you that watched the, the webinar last week, there's there's nothing there's nothing particularly new on these ones. The ACE inhibitors, as the perindopril, is our local favourite, hence why it's in blue. But there are lots lots of ACE inhibitors uh, and lots um, that people swear by and some that say they never work and then other people swear by them. So there's, there's lots of there's lots of to and throwing with which ones to use, but perindopril is our local one. What do ACE inhibitors do? This is the, the RAS uh, control of blood pressure that we talked about last week. So renin's released by the juxtaposable apparatus in the um, 
uh, within the bonus capsule. And then we, um, so angiotensinogen that's released by the liver normally is, is just free floating in the blood. Renin cuts that into angiotensin one, and then it meets angiotensin converting enzyme, which converts it to angiotensin two. What we do is we block angiotensin converting enzyme, uh, which in turn means you don't get any angiotensin two, right? So we don't get any of that. You don't get any uh, antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary gland. You don't get aldosterone being reduced from the, um, the renal cortex, you don't get the vasoconstriction associated with angiotensin C. Um, and then of course you don't get these three um, areas here within the actual nephron itself. So you don't get the sodium reabsorption uh, within the proximal and distal convoluted tubules with them collecting ducts and obviously the water reabsorption through water channels in the later collecting ducts with uh, antidiuretic hormone. So you don't get any of that action, you reduce um, vaso, you get vasodilation relatively, don't you, with, with ACE inhibitors, um, and you, you get um, uh, effectively, a, uh, with, with ACE inhibitors, they, they increase, obviously, reabsorption of water um, through the nephron and increase circulating volume. So we, we, we get rid of that, those functions. Perfect. So the, um, the next ones we'll talk about, angiotensin receptor blockers, again, not favoured. They don't work as well. Uh, you'll remember these from last week. Candesartin is our local favoured one. Uh, angiotensin uh, receptor blockers uh, work on angiotensin 2. They, they block angiotensin 2 competitively at the, um, the, the renal cortex. So they, they stop aldosterone being produced, okay? There is still an element of antidiuretic hormone being produced. There is still an element of, um, of vasoconstriction from the angiotensin 2 that is out in circulation. Of course, that does have an element of effect on the sodium uh, reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule, but you don't get aldosterone, which is, which is a very, very uh, potent um, uh, antidiuretic. Okay, um, so beta blockers, bisoprolol being being kind of everyone's go-to, but uh, nivivolol certainly becoming quite popular in our local area. A couple of the cardiologists there are prescribing nivivolol quite a lot in atrial fib. Um, I wonder whether whether that will, will cross over into heart failure too, but at the moment we use bisoprolol, atenolol is, is commonly used as well. Um, beta receptors, uh, you've got beta-1 receptors in the heart, beta-2 receptors in the uh, in the lungs, one heart, two lungs, that's the easiest way to remember it. Um, they are, they, they, they effectively block the um, sympathetic nerve uh, stimulation of the heart and, and lungs, so reduce heart rate, reduce cardiac output, um, but uh, unfortunately they do uh, cause bronchial constriction to some degree, so patients with asthma COPD um, tend not to get on too well on beta blockers. Um, but if you remember that slide a little way, way back, patients with COPD in diagnosed heart failure, we still try the beta blockers. Obviously, they're not tolerated. They're not tolerated. But. So the um, potassium sparing, uh, spironolactone is the only one that, uh, that we use here. So um, effectively, what, what spironolactone does is it blocks um, aldosterone. Um, aldosterone works in the, uh, the late distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. Um, and what aldosterone does is it encourages um, sodium, or it encourages potassium to be excreted, encourages sodium to be um, uh, excreted into the, um, the filtrate. What we do with potassium sparing is um, we stop the, um, uh, get this the right way around. So with, with potassium sparing, um, spironolactone uh, medication encourages uh, more sodium back out into the, um, into the filtrate. Uh, and in doing so, will encourage water to follow it with it. So it has a diuretic effect, um, but it blocks aldosterone um, within the uh, within the basal cells of the of the late distal convoluted tubule and, and stops it having its effect on on sodium and potassium. Um, loop diuretics uh, are the first line, kind of when they become symptomatic. The three we use: furosemide, bumetanide, and terazomide, which is a new one. Terazomide seems to have good feedback from the trials anyway so it seems to be becoming a favorite although it's still relatively expensive so furizamide is is used first line bumetanide if they don't tolerate that um and furizamide they say so all loop diuretics um they they work within the loop of henley um and uh in effect are, are just encouraging um encouraging fluid loss into the filtrate so making the filtrate relatively hyperosmolar encouraging fluid out um, from the from the, the cells around it within the uh, the interstitium of the of the kidney. Um, 
and that is it in, t in terms of medications diuretics are, are relatively simple so with um the case study tonight so we're going to use mentimeter in just a second so i'll flick over the screen so we have um tonight a 62 year old male that presents with uh, dyspnea on exertion comes to your surgery it's not an uncommon uh, presentation you notice on on your examination he's got bilateral pitting edema to the ankles his chest is clear he is obese, 40 pack years, and he works as an HUE driver. So we're, we're thinking actually it may not be uh, the, 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 the healthiest chap going. Um, so we haven't seen him in a long time. So uh, as far as we're aware, he's not diagnosed with anything. He's not on any medication. So what we're going to do is flick over to Mentimeter. So we go to menti.com. And um, what I want you to do, bear with me, I'm just going to try and drag this down. There we go. Go to menti.com, put the code in that you see at the top of the screen. So that's 506693506693. And it's just a word game, this one. So um, you have the chance to um, tell me. So other than um, NT Pro BMP, what else should you measure? What else should we be looking at? Don't don't just uh, measure. Probably isn't the right word. What what else? What else should we be looking for in this in this chat? Blood pressure, good. Chances are he's had some hypertension that's not been diagnosed. Bloods, be a bit more specific. Chest X-ray, FBC, good. ECG, chest X-ray, urea, electrolytes, good. Heart rates, potassium, I like that, good. Yeah, a bit more history. Chest X-ray, heart rates. Saturations, absolutely. Yeah, potentially D dimer. Um, potentially, G if you're thinking PE, though, you should be going into hospital. Um, good. Uh, thyroid function, HbA1c, other bloods, using these LFTs, ACR, good. D dimer, sodium, sodium, potassium, SATs, urine, ACR. Troponin, yeah, potentially troponin. Um, it, if it, certainly, if it's a more of an acute history of sudden onset of breathlessness, absolutely, you want to rule out a cardiac cause. But again, troponin and um, and D dimer. If we're thinking either of those things, we're we're, we're probably looking more uh, A and E or ambulatory care, aren't we? Good, I like it. Some good answers coming back there. Perfect. Chat. Oh, thank you, Charlotte's put the number in there. Perfect. So it's the same number for the next uh, for the next couple of questions. So I'm just going to get back to this. So his um, NT Pro BMP has come back at three one eight seven. Um, what? Uh, so his renal function is 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 unremarkable. Um, oh, let me bring back the next question. Good. Anyone else putting in sats on exertion? I like that. That's good, especially with COVID going on at the moment. Uh, real function troponin, good, perfect. So we've got a we've got a markedly raised um, BNP, haven't we? Just the only thing with Zoom is you end up with bars all over the place. You can't see where you're trying to click. Perfect. So, what's the correct initial treatment then? This is the uh, the next question. So you've got four options. So it's the same um, the same code on menti.com. Five zero six six nine three. We've got four options. To choose from. Everyone have a vote. So we've got option A is start on an ACE inhibitor and refer routine his cardiology. Two, start on a uh, potassium sparing um, diuretic and refer urgently to cardiology. Um, start on an ACE inhibitor and a loop diuretic and refer urgently to cardiology. Or start on a calcium channel blocker and refer urgently to cardiology. So start ACE and go uh, routine, start the MRA or potassium sparing, go uh, urgently, start um, ACE and a loop diuretic and go urgently, or start a calcium channel blocker and refer urgently. Everyone have a vote. Let's see where everyone's going. Good. Lovely. A few more of you a chance to have a little vote. I think the the over the overwhelming answer there is is for C, which is correct. Well done. So we're going to start an ACE inhibitor and a loop diuretic because he's symptomatic. He has he has ankle edema, doesn't he? So the um, the ACE inhibitor isn't necessarily going to do any of that um, by itself. So uh, we'd be looking at starting furosemide or terazomide if your if your local area uses that. 
um, and urgent referral over 2000, BMP over 2000 gets a two week referral to um, cardiology for TTE. Perfect. Uh, I think there's one more question. What are your other differentials in this case? It's another text one. Text in. MI, definitely, yeah, yeah, breathlessness, pulmonary embolism, COPD, atrial fib, good. Uh, COPD, I assume that's a, uh, also correct. Decom sense CKD, yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Very sick. <laughs> uh, acute MI is possible, isn't it? It's possible, if, especially if he's got undiagnosed diabetes going on or something like that. Um, good, good. Liver disease, yeah, I like it. If you think back to that list, actually, don't you, of, of all the of all the cases that can raise your BNP, um, but COPD would be up there, wouldn't it? If he's been smoking, uh, he's got forty plus uh, pack year smoking history, um, sedentary lifestyle, and um, an overweight. I think I think we could probably put him in high risk for COPD. Could have undiagnosed um, diabetes and therefore uh, in CKD already. Although his renal function was okay, wasn't it from that from the blood tests? Um, he could have some liver cirrhosis. He could be uh, an alcoholic on the side. Absolutely. Old age, yeah, he wasn't quite old enough for us to be considering. So over seventy, we consider normal raised um, raised BMP. And STEMI, uh, I do like the, the the differentials there of the heart. You've always got to think uh, acute cardiac, haven't you? Um, especially in primary care, I think sometimes we we um, we uh, we often, but the biggest one everyone's going for is COPD. Um, and absolutely, that's that's exactly right. With a forty-plus year pack history, uh, if, if cardiology wrote back to you and said, "Is I, I doubt they would," with a BMP of over three thousand, but if cardiology wrote back to you and said, "His heart's fine," think of something else. It would definitely be COPD. And and remember those tests you're going to order in that interim period of of chest X-ray and other bloods, ECG, all that type of stuff, um, is going to help you make a decision if if heart failure turns out not to be the answer. Okay. They're good. Any other pulmonary effusion? Yeah, good one. I like that. Lovely. Well done, guys. So I'll flick back. Um, that's that's the end of tonight. Um, Charlotte is just going to put in the chat um, the link to get your CPD certificates. It's just a little quiz um, to fill out, uh, and then a little like feedback sheet to fill out. So if Charlotte doesn't mind just putting that in there, if everyone hangs on just for that to appear, uh, and then quickly click on it before it, it disappears under the the inevitable uh 97 thank yous that, that get put in the chat which is lovely but then we uh, we lose the uh, we lose the the link so if uh charlotte's ready there we go thank you very much so um you have to fill out all sections otherwise it won't work perfect so so that's the link for the um the automatic cpd uh, certificate so thank you very much guys it's been it's been uh, Another good one tonight. Thank you for the questions that came in. If you have any questions, now's the time to ask. Um, you can always uh, email, text, WhatsApp us um, at any point. Uh, if you do come up with stuff, um, please do get in touch. We're back in two weeks' time, Monday the 15th of February. Uh, we're going to do um, atrial fibrillation and palpitations uh, staying on the cardiac theme. Then we'll be doing the work up for those. Um, a little bit more uh, for, for us to do in primary care than the with, with heart failure, but heart failure is one of those ones we all dread because um, you know patients patient quality of life is, is quite poor. So, um, but thank you very much for coming along, everyone, and uh, I really I really hope you've it's been useful tonight. If you want to suggest future content or, or anything else, then then please do let us know. Otherwise, um, click on the link, um, fill out the, uh, the the feedback, and you can get a certificate. Um, we do also ask if, if you, if you, especially if you're new to us and uh, and you've enjoyed tonight, then please do leave us a review. Um, it does help people find us for our uh, for our courses and our paid sessions. Of course, we'd like to keep these webinars free. Uh, apparently, the link's not working, Charlotte. So I don't know if um, we can have a look. Let me try and click on it. See what it does. Oh, it's working for me. So, um, it comes up with something like this. I don't know if I can share my, so when, when I click on it, I get that. And then you fill out and then you get a certificate at the end. Hmm. 
maybe we're maybe we're overloading it because half half the people are saying it's working, half are saying it's not. Uh, maybe we've overloaded metal. I don't know. <laughs> um, the, that, that link that link is definitely the right link. So um, if you um, John, if you're struggling with it, maybe just try it again in in ten fifteen minutes. Um, fab but uh, thank you thank you guys everyone that's leaving have a great evening uh, any questions you're more than welcome Uh, Amy, any advice for pre-hospital? Uh, what uh, what um, specifically are you after? No problem. More than welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Oh, sorry, Amy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, within within pre-hospital care, most ambulance trusts have furosemide. So, um, acute heart failure or, or exacerbation of heart failure, then then we could always give IV furosemide, um, uh, normally forty milligrams uh, stat dose. Um, and yeah, treat treat what you find. Otherwise, uh, oromorph can be useful for the breathlessness sensation, um, particularly in in palliative care. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you know, combination of, of IV furosemide and some RMO for dyspnea, I think, is is not is not unreasonable. Um, oxygen if they're sat so low, but again, if if you're, if you're looking at an end of life care patient with with kind of acute exacerbation, then probably um, look to their GP or, or their um, or their palliative care team for for some advice. Obviously, it tends to always be two in the morning, doesn't it? So, um, if you are, if, it, if it's uh, if it's just a kind of acute flare up, then then you just have to do your best with diuretics and and um, settling them down somehow. Uh, Gladiola, the only thiazide that's used is benzoflumethazide uh, over here now, um, but we we tend to prefer um, the thiazide like diuretics, so in dapamide. <laughs> Uh, is there anything that might give you a better idea? Um, no, I think history. So the the the, the you know eighty eighty percent of this diagnosis definitely does come from the history. We're we're not going to be able to do BNP in the ambulance service for a while. I wouldn't have thought. Um, so I think just getting your history and and putting together the risk factors um, are, are are good enough. I mean, listening to listening to heart and lung sounds, um, listening for any edema, examining the ankles for peripheral edema. Um, that type of stuff is is definitely going to help. See you next week, guys. Thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely. GTN, you've got GTN as well for uh, for a kind of acute burst. Uh, obviously, the half life of GTN is quite short, so it's it's um, furosemide is is going to is going to help them more more than likely. Um, so in heart failure, so nitrates, don't forget, we just want to be a little bit more careful with blood pressure in, in, in pulmonary edema and, and giving GTN. So current jail calc guidance is over 110 systolic, and you can see some quite significant drops, particularly in, in um, systolic heart failure. So, uh, or systolic dysfunction. So, um, yeah, nitrates with caution, they're short-lived. Um, so if you do overdo it, it's, it's almost certainly not going to last that long, but Again, short-lived, so the patient's not going to have, have ex, uh, experienced relief for very long. I think furosemide, IV furosemide, is is um, still preferential. And no oromorph anymore. Uh, it's a shame. You can give a little bit of um, subcut or IM injectable. Also works. Um,
Yeah, GTN first sign um, in, in Jail Calc. The um, GTN is, is first sign and, and Friesamide as well. But the um, as I say, just you, you do you do tend to see bigger bigger drops in in uh, blood pressure. Yeah, Amy. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, Friesamide. You're, you're right. Friesamide isn't as instant as GTN. Um, absolutely right. Any more questions, folks? Oh, you're welcome. Sorry, Jan, it's not working. It does. It, it seems to be looking looking at the screen. Um, we're getting lots of feedback coming in on it already. So it does. It does seem to be we've just overloaded them. I think um, if you just keep the link saved somewhere and and try it again, um, maybe a bit later this evening. Once once um, I think there's just too many people trying to do it at once. Uh, heart failure and right bundle branch block. So right bundle branch block won't won't uh, won't affect your management of heart failure at all. Right, it's um, right bundle branch blocks normally normally asymptomatic. Oh, you're welcome, Adam. Fab. Yeah, I was XLAS, so it's still do bank. So uh, welcome along. Nice to see you. Um, so primary care. Uh, let's uh, so yeah. So I think the the, the 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 thing about primary care is you, you you think it's it I don't know how how best I kind of th describe it but um so the the learning curve was way steeper than I thought it was going to be and I think I came in knowing that uh, it was going to be a steep learning curve but it was uh, it was a lot uh, a lot steeper than I thought it was going to be this last year has been a lot of head in books uh, my my advice would be get in touch with somebody um, who who's done the change and see whether you can spend some time with them that's what I did I worked with a couple of paramedics that I I knew from the LAS that had left and and got into primary care and loved it and I spent some time with them and I think that helps you understand the kinds of things that you're going to need to learn um, but yeah don't don't underestimate the the steep curve. <laughs> Good night, Alan. I'll turn off recording now since just a few more around.